to Rcast, the official podcast to the Rchain Cooperative. Rchain is a complete, concurrent blockchain platform designed for maximum efficiency at minimal computational and environmental costs by utilizing proof of stake. Beyond our platform, our investment partner, Reflective Ventures, funds organizations that are working within our core mission statement to create a better world by enabling social coordination in robust, secure, and scalable ways. I'm Derek Barris, the Director of Content for Archain. Each week on Rcast, I'll be talking with the founders of our portfolio companies, as well as co-op members, staff, and other figures in the Archain ecosystem about the most pressing issues in blockchain today. Please check out archain.coop to learn more about the platform, our community, validator sale, and information on becoming a member. Waymo vehicles driving around Chandler, Arizona were surprised recently when rock and knife-wielding residents launched a series of attacks. Google's self-driving car fleet suffered slashed tires and bruised bodies. As the New York Times put it, in ways large and small, the city has had an early look at public misgivings over the rise of artificial intelligence, with city officials hearing complaints about everything from safety to possible job losses. I recently chatted with Nathan Schneider about the Luddites, as we share a fascination with this early 19th century group in England that traveled around destroying the cotton and woolen mills that were stealing away their livelihood. Unfortunately for the mill owners, many were injured or killed in the process, as this machinery was not self-driving. While today we use Luddite as a term to laugh at technological curmudgeons refusing to evolve with the times, Kirkpatrick Sale puts it best in his history of the group, Rebels Against the Future. Beware the technological juggernaut. Reckon the terrible costs. Understand the world's being lost and the world being gained. Reflect on the price of the machine and its systems on your life. Pay attention to the natural world and its increasing destruction. Resist the seductive catastrophe of industrialism. Need we lose our technology to save our soul? Not if we change the economic system governing it. I've learned a lot reading Nathan's work, including his latest book, Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That is Shaping the Next Economy, as well as the book he co-edited, Ours to Hack and Own, The Rise of Platform Cooperativism, A New Vision of, for the Future of Work, and a Fairer Internet. Besides his career in journalism, Nathan is also a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and as you can imagine, he is a fan of co-ops. During our talk, we discuss the value of public and private blockchains and how even in the decentralized thrust of many blockchain projects, the old rules are just being pasted onto new ventures. How co-ops actually foster a true culture of individualism while the corporate model demands a sort of mass conformity and interesting bits of history, such as the fact that credit cards were basically a dead industry until Bank of America launched a co-op model for banking. Only after that success did privatization and the continual debt crisis ensue. 10% of the world's employees work for cooperatives in some capacity, and, to my surprise, the United States leads the world in number of co-ops at 40,000. After hearing Nathan talk, you won't want to smash your smartphone, but you might just question who you're buying it from and what service provider you're paying off every month. I want to pull back for a moment. I was listening to an interview with Will Store, the journalist who I also had on my personal podcast earlier this year after the release of his book Selfie, which is about how the world became so self-obsessed. And he brings up the point of different experiments that have been done between Japanese and American culture showing that there is a stark difference between how a communal-focused culture such as Japan looks at themselves as compared to a very individualist culture, America, other Western cultures, which brings up the idea a cooperative model is really about working together and no one particularly takes the lead financially. It's more spread out and wealth distribution and everyone gets a role. 
So knowing that we've moved into such an individualist culture and it seems to be getting worse and worse as we progress technologically, how do we get people to cooperate more often in models that uh, such as you express in your work? Well, you know, thanks for this. And I, I actually don't think of cooperatives as kind of anti-individualist, um, you know, and part of it is because I'm personally, you know, not a, um, you know, I'm an introvert. I, I kind of tend to operate on my own, you know, as a journalist and then as a scholar. I like, I like forms of work that don't involve seeing the same people every single day, uh, day in and day out and, and um, you know, having to run every, every crazy idea you have by the whole team. You know, and so I think of this as uh, more a question of accountability. You know, it's a it's a business model in which uh, in which the participants in an enterprise happen to be the people who own and govern it, and it's they're the people to whom it's accountable, right? Uh, so whether they're customers like at REI or a credit union, you know, the thing is accountable to them. If they're you know workers, you know, the profits of the business go to them rather than to some shareholder somewhere. But that doesn't mean that they're sitting around singing kumbaya all day. You know, I'm really grateful, for instance, that, you know, my credit union doesn't call me every time they have to decide whether to make a loan to somebody. You know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, that that's not necessary. And this is actually part of a cooperative tradition we have in this country. For instance, my grandfather, something I learned while I was writing uh, this book, Everything for Everyone, uh, my grandfather, who was a farm boy from Colorado, you know, became the director of a of a large national purchasing cooperative for hardware. And his company was called Liberty Distributors. Kind of distinguishing feature of the company compared to, you know, other hardware cooperatives like Ace Hardware, True Value, very you know prominent brands around the country, is that Liberty was all about using the cooperative model to enable local stores to be more individualistic to actually enable them to have more control over how they branded themselves and what stock they carried. When you look at, you know, the hardware store in my town that's a member of Ace Hardware, the cooperative enables it to be much more tailored to the culture of the town than the Home Depot conglomerate down the road. So actually, it's the corporate model, in my view, that expects this kind of mass conformity. And the cooperative model is a strategy for enabling um, businesses to help people be their fuller selves, uh, and, and so so I don't think, especially in the in the U.S. context, but also uh, you know elsewhere, uh, that 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 cooperatives are in any way antithetical to a kind of individualist uh, culture or a kind of you know pioneering culture. In fact, you know this model can be used That's a really to, good to point. amplify and this. Since tendencies. I began work at our chain, I left full time work 15 years ago because I was, like you said, being a I was a professional journalist at the time, full time, and I got tired of being in the same office and the same people all the time. And this is my first real foray back into a full time situation in that long, and the freedoms that I'm offered, and more to the point, the ability of being like you're an expert in this here you go with it is very liberating so i guess though i think it does run up against the more capitalist model which i often personally associate with individualism but this idea that there is this vast wealth gap that we've seen over the decades grow and grow between the top players and the rest of the staff. And you actually write about the mechanical Turkers, which I remember when that first happened, I looked in as a freelancer, I looked into it and I was like, these are just insane rates and you're competing against people for dollars on the hour. So how does a cooperative model work in a country that is dominated at least mentally by capitalism? Well, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a, Capitalism kind of offers individualism for the few, you know, it, it, it offers Steve Jobs individualism where like one or two people get to, you know, get to have their imagination go wild and then everybody else is a servant to that imagination. And then write books about how you can do it too. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, it's a very deceptive ideology and it's one, you know, for instance, I see among my students very frequently, you know, this Steve Jobs can do it, you can do it too. No, actually, the, the system that enabled Steve Jobs to do what he did um, 
uh, actually militates against you ever being like that, probably. When in contrast, a model in which that, that enables, you know, small businesses to remain small businesses while also having access to economies of scale through national cooperative purchasing provides a very different uh, model. And it, it also requires, you know, leaders, you know, for instance, my grandfather, as I mentioned, you know, he was a he, he was a leader. He was somebody who built something with a, he who had vision and so forth. You know, the the kind of un, unfortunate fact in a certain respect is that, you know, his profits went back to his members. So, you know, he wasn't able to have all this money lying around to self-aggrandize and to, you know, make himself look like the most important person in the world. You know, he he ended up with, you know, he was able to support his family. He was able, you know, his family, you know, really did better than it was doing before. You know, it's a different kind of wealth accumulation. And so we we forget our cooperative heroes and leaders. And then we start to imagine that, oh, it's just this kind of bland crowd that makes these things happen. No, you know, th- there are incredible people who have built the cooperative movement through U.S. history, and we we lose sight of those you know of those leaders. You know we lose sight of that that role of vision and imagination. People like you know Murray Lincoln was a guy who um, he he was one of the architects of the rural electric cooperatives in the 1930s. You know when within about a decade cooperatives enabled 90% of rural America to get electricity when the investor-owned companies wouldn't do it. This guy was in and out of the White House every day. He, w- he was a, a CEO at, at um, a Nationwide, uh, a mutual insurance company. Uh, he was you know, owned by its, its, uh, its members. But we lose this story because he doesn't fit this particular self-aggrandizing capitalist uh, mode. Yet he developed these incredibly powerful cooperatives that reshaped the American landscape. You know, capitalism has kind of taken so much credit for um, stuff that actually much more diverse kinds of models have, have built. For instance, you know, you think of like credit cards as like the apogee of capitalism, right? Credit cards are like what enables capitalism to, you know, you know brings kind of, uh, you know, lending to everybody's pocket, um, you know. The Visa, what became Visa, originally Bank America was run by Bank of America. It wasn't working under the corporate model. And this visionary small city, you know, uh, who's a regional banker in Seattle, uh, D. Hawk, you know, said to Bank of America, hey, this isn't working at all. Let's spin this off as a separate cooperative made up of these banks. And that was what made the credit card movement, the credit card phenomenon really work. Then after the cooperatives built that industry, it got demutualized, privatized, turned into a, this kind of rapacious, um, exploitative uh, industry. But it was actually the cooperative movement, the cooperative model that enabled you know, that feature of capitalism to grow. Um, there's so many stories like that um, where cooperative models actually enabled things that then later capitalism took credit for. And, you know, I play a game with myself where I go into like a strip mall and just look around and notice all the things that are there because of cooperatives, uh, whether it's, you know, the organic food or the, you know, the fair trade coffee or the the, the visa uh, labels in the windows or the small business, you know, the the, the chains like Dairy Queen and, and uh, uh, Best Western that have cooperatives built into their model. And all of that stuff, most people look at and say, oh, that's capitalism at work, uh, when in fact, no, that there's another logic at play uh, that has helped build some of the best parts of our world. And that brings to mind something that blows my mind personally, because I think there is a newish co- a co-op that is here in Culver City where I live. My wife and I are going to join Uh, I used to live by the Park Slope Co-op. There's so many things that are related to agriculture in the cooperative movement. I didn't even know until reading your book that Land O'Lakes was a cooperative. So there, there are so many examples of this. And yet, talking about the branding and marketing of capitalism, how does such a large segment of the rural and agricultural population in America vote for an administration that is exactly against what is in their best interests. Well, it's not. It's not totally clear. I mean, at least, sure, we. You know, you can have the argument about best interests and and um, and so forth. But actually, if you look at the relationship to those cooperatives and politicians, like the Republican Party has, I think, a better understanding of 
the importance of cooperative enterprise in American history than the Democratic Party, because the Democrats have retreated so much to the urban areas where cooperatives are generally small and marginal. Like, you know, I love the Park Slope Food Co-op. My wife used to be a member, you know, beautiful place. Um, I was kind of an interloper, bad behavior. I, I, um, I uh, need to do a lot of penance for that. Urban consumer cooperatives, for instance, were kind of born of the 60s, were counterculture. They were never really intended to serve large economies. They were kind of they, they were about a marginal counterculture. And that's fine. But it means that progressives don't actually understand the dire importance of cooperatives informing, you know, the economy of this country. You know, the, the fact that when I go up to my, you know, my relatives farms in northern Colorado, you know, they've got their tanks that say Agfinity on them. That's a cooperative. They're buying from their inputs from a cooperative. And then their beets still go to the beet processing co-op in, in Fort Morgan, you know, that we've been going to for a century. Their whole livelihood is built on this model. They're getting their electricity from a cooperative, you know. And and so you look at someone like Mike Pence, he's been supported and worked with like, the Indiana co-ops and, cre- you know, electric co-ops and credit unions for years. Whereas, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, Democratic politicians, especially since uh, the Clinton years, have just kind of abandoned and, and failed to understand how rural America works. You know, you end up with weird stuff where like the 2016 Democratic and Republican platforms both advocated expanding employee ownership. They have totally different reasons for saying that, you know, but like there's this weird way in which we have this opportunity for you know, a new consensus where, you know, both Democrats and Republicans are talking about credit unions. Uh, the, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act, which enables more conversions of small, medium sized businesses to uh, employee ownership, had total down the line bipartisan support. That's like not supposed to happen right now. <laughs> But it's, it's made up of this, this history. And now progressives are just starting to discover, hey, there's this whole tradition of grassroots democratic economy. Let's really get behind that. And, you know, in some respects, you know, Republicans have been sitting on it while they've been kind of neglecting its radicalism and, and thinking of it as kind of the status quo as opposed to this really um, transformative opportunity and movement. You know, nothing is really inevitable except perhaps what we're doing to the climate and environment but even that can can be changed and and because of regulations and you you advocate for changes in regulations that are more cooperative and employee friendly i am not as aware even what you just said about bipartisan support i was not aware because most of my time is just just before we were talking i was scrolling through my news feed and seeing that the administration now is trying to cut some hw bush wetlands uh, regulations to to open up more wetlands for exploration. So we're moving so backwards in that. But do you feel that there is more uh, awareness, or in terms of real regulatory power of protecting workers, uh, and um, perhaps I don't want to say subsidies for co-ops, although that could be an idea. But do you do you think this is going to get more traction as we move forward? Well, I, I think there's tremendous opportunity. And, and I, uh, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up the question of subsidy. I, I don't think subsidy for co-op is a bad thing, at the very least, because there's already such tremendous subsidy for investor-owned businesses. The, the way in which the political system is slanted to um, support those who accumulate large amounts of money, the way in which capital gains, tax structures benefit those who are primarily investors rather than actual value creators. The way in which local jurisdictions, you know, the cartoonish case is Amazon, but this happens every day all over the country, in which, you know, low, uh, especially very desperate communities shell out tons of money to subsidize uh, the entry of extractive businesses to come and employ uh, their people and then extract the value somewhere else. You know, we're subsidizing investor ownership as a business model left and right, whereas cooperative models, which are um, resistant to investor ownership, are kind of left in the lurch by that kind of bias. And so when we've had explosions of really productive cooperative development, it's been through um, through policy-based recognition that we need to level the playing field. So for instance, when those electric cooperatives came up and really transformed rural America, it was because the Department of Agriculture, through the um, the Rural Electrification Act of 1936, was able to issue essentially bank rate loans 
to co-ops. Was that, you know, preference? Was that unfair? Uh, no, that meant cooperators were able to get the same, you know, cost of financing as banks. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with that? Um, what's unfair about that? Uh, it, you know, now uh, I think we have an opportunity to expand that kind of policy. You know, when you look at the um, employee ownership in this country, we have 14 million beneficiaries of employee stock ownership plans. That's largely because in the 70s and 80s, you know, some adjustments were made to the tax code that just ensured that there wasn't double taxation on um, uh, employee ownership, employee stock ownership plans. Suddenly, this model became very attractive um, just because, you know, the law had been corrected to appropriately accommodate it. You know, I think we need to uh, develop a kind of a kind of politics that demands that um, community-based businesses have uh, an equal chance uh, uh, with investor-controlled businesses. Uh, that that when we talk about entrepreneurship, our entrepreneurs have a have a genuine choice when they have a great idea to decide whether they want to sell it to investors or sell it to the to the users, the people or workers or whoever um, the right you know, stakeholder classes or classes. We need to just think in terms of enabling this to be a meaningful option in the economy again um, across sectors. And and I think, you know, to get to our chain's particular context, you know, the crypto world could be a place where we can help level that playing field. But so far, um, unfortunately, a lot of the rules of the old economy are just being kind of copied into the new one. Being copied and the sort of vitriol and ignorance that exists because of social media it, it just perpetuates it i i really it's disheartening i mean it, it it's very energizing in terms of a lot of the people that i work with on a daily basis who are so focused and understand the benefits of this and our portfolio companies and people really doing good things uh, but then you have the, the the sort of you know bubble of social media and the crypto world which you know, I think the very first mistake was treating cryptocurrencies like stocks and derivatives and thinking that you could just make a quick dollar, which is exactly to your point. It, it misses everything. But I do think there's a lot of opportunity in that space, and I, I hope to see more of it. Yeah, you know, when, when I first I heard, first heard like whispers about Bitcoin and stuff, you know, pretty early on from, you know, the activist folks I was I was reporting on a lot of the time. And I just wasn't interested in it. You know, oh, great, more money. You know, like, do we really need a new kind of money in the world? Right. When I first learned about the Ethereum white paper just a few weeks after it came out, you know, it's just so exciting that, oh, wow, this isn't just about money. This is about an opportunity to kind of rewrite our social contracts. That's so exciting. And it's so great that so many brilliant people have dived into this opportunity and learned and and started hacking away and trying to build these kind of new social contracts. But at the same time, I think we've imported a bias, a kind of vision that we were never able to impose on you know, on on the existing economy of a kind of radical uh, economizing of everything, turning every question from a, a choice into a, a, an economic calculation. And this was built a bias built into Bitcoin. It was a it was very much an economic logic that good economics will save us rather than politics. Politics is something you want to eliminate. You want to um, reduce the opportunity for friction of people's involvement. You know, what I see in crypto is an opportunity to actually deepen politics, uh, to create a, a, a richer, more appropriate politics where people's needs and wants and, and longings can be better heard and better uh, incorporated into how decisions are made. Um, and that economics you know, can actually be kind of automated and drifted to the side. I want to be done with economics. I want, you know, economics to, I think economics can be, a, you know, a kind of solved, uh, a solved question. Um, let's move on to the interesting stuff, which is politics. I think, unfortunately, we've, um, the bias has inclined people to build economic systems above all, to fixate on the economics in a way that's going to uh, lessen the opportunities for people to bring their full humanity to the table uh, in, in these projects. Mm. I, I really appreciate your optimism in so many ways and, and clear thinking on these things, truly. I am currently working on a book just started called Anatomy of Distraction. My other career for those 15 years, and I still do some of it, is as a fitness instructor. So sort of balancing my introversion, I get to go up in front of people and move with them and 
It's been a lifelong passion. And the book, though, I had to turn back because the book specifically deals with how our, how since the Industrial Revolution, how our increasing dependence upon technologies is literally changing our anatomy and physiology for the worse in a, in a lot of ways. And so I'm reading Kirkpatrick Sale's Rebels Against the Future, which is the history of the Luddites right now. And I, I know in ours to hack and own, there's a chapter on the Luddites. And I, I wonder... What is a Luddite today? What function do they play in the governance and economic models that we have right now? Mm, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, the the Luddites were you know people who saw um, technology being developed in a way that was uh, that was side sidelining their humanity. That was that was um, devaluing their skills. In a lot of respects, I think we've been really fooled away from that kind of clear sightedness. You know, when we look at the new kind of platform economies uh, that have been emerging in the in the last few years, and the and the growing prevalence of a kind of surveillance economy and so forth, we're we're kind of in a deer in the headlights moment. You know, we see the newness that we've been presented with so many benefits of these things um, that we are not seeing the costs, um, and we're especially not recognizing the way in which this is a kind of recapitulation of what. The Luddites we're seeing, which is a machine is taking away the best parts of your job, the craftsmanship, the craftspersonship, and replacing it with uh, uh, leaving you only with the worst parts of your job, which is, you know, you're just kind of feeding the algorithms and you're, uh, you know, feeding the machine, doing the, the kind of replicable uh, uh, work that has nothing to do with the craft, you know, is part of what makes you human. I think we need a new kind of uh, Ludditism. Uh, not simply in the sense of, uh, you know, first in that willingness to resist, you know, the fact that there are no Facebook users unions that are actively resisting the kind of very, very dangerous behavior of the platform, that there's no forms of organizing, active organizing among people who are stakeholders in these um, in these technologies is very troubling that we've been kind of duped and alienated and isolated. That's where the individualism is most dangerous, where we're all kind of acting as discrete individuals rather than recognizing that we have some common, you know, that, that we're in a kind of common struggle here. You know, we're, we're, we're way behind uh, in many respects. Again, I think there are opportunities to, you know, to reclaim that in, the, you know, in these platforms and especially, you know, the, the tools in the, in the blockchain world that uh, look toward finding new modes of bringing people together, forming new forms, kinds of solidarity. We have to recognize the way in which the platforms like Facebook have been very intentionally designed to reduce solidarity, to make sure that we're all seeing different things, we're all experiencing it differently, we're encountering it as individuals alone. Uh, we're not thinking of ourselves as possibly um, having something in common, whereas if nothing else, even the speculative side of the crypto experience has kind of given people a little taste of the experience of kind of being in something together, having a common enterprise um, in which they're all kind of standing or falling, in this case on the speculative price, but it could be uh, on, on better bases as well. And I think that's what we want to build for, is recognizing what are our actual shared interests, you know, what do we have in common and how can we build tools that allow us to reclaim the solidarity that has been kind of stripped away by the uh, nature of the platform economy so far. Speaking specifically of blockchain, a number of people I've talked to really feel that whatever their personal feelings on it, that enterprise adoption is going to be what is going to drive blockchain technology and put it forward for mainstream adoption, which would also probably negate the idea of a purely public blockchain as a lot of the companies will be building on private blockchains. Do you have any feelings on the roles of the public versus the private blockchains? And if there's any dangers, does the does a private chain really stand up to the uh, sort of ideals that, uh, you know, it was originally created for? I, I don't think it's necessarily an immediate disaster. I think there are also disasters to be found in public chains, right? Um, uh, there, there is a kind of a speculation, a, a um, you know, th there are dangers on both sides. You know, one thing that I think is a, an interesting opportunity, these kinds of private uh, uh, enterprise uh, models can actually be really useful for upgrading 
what has worked best in cooperative enterprise in the last century. You know, the largest, uh, a lot of the largest cooperatives, you know, in the U.S., for instance, are purchasing cooperatives that do joint purchasing among a large number of small businesses. And, you know, I work pretty closely with people from one of those, and they're very interested in blockchain for coordinating their supply chains. And that would be a private chain model, but it would be a kind of cooperative chain in the sense that it's it's helping to coordinate the joint purchasing of a bunch of small businesses all over the country, right? And that this technology could help us do that even better to spin up, you know, small purchasing cooperatives or large ones very, very quickly, uh, turn this from being a slow, boring, uh, hidden process to something that is just part of how business is done, that we could build cooperatives as a kind of, you know, as easily as we build a, a Facebook group. You know, so that's a real opportunity within the private space. Now, I think it would be great for those things to be public. So we would have open supply chains and the flow of value would be much more transparent. And, you know, we could move toward a less kind of uh, walled garden approach to running the economy. But that's that's a few steps down the line. And I think at the moment, a private chain that's cooperatively owned would not be so bad and actually presents some really exciting opportunities for supporting small and medium sized businesses, enabling them to you know, do what they do better. Right. And hopefully protect our data better is one of the things even, you know, that's why I'm a fan of, I, I don't, I, I have my feelings on the bigger picture, but in terms of, of just anything that will get us better security is, is a good thing at this point. Uh, you write that co-ops take hold when regular order is in flux. And you also mentioned, and I didn't know this, that 10% of the world's total employment happens through co-ops and that the United States is the leader in that with 40,000 cooperative businesses. Do you think this is a, an example of a lack of marketing that people don't realize how influential co-ops are and why we should, as we've been talking about, bring them to the, to the front more often? Yeah, and I mean, active uh, lack of marketing combined with active repression for decades. Um, <laughs> in the 1930s, 40s, even into the 50s, the U.S. government, for instance, would out produce propaganda films about how great cooperatives were. You know, this was like going to be the next step of democracy. You know, of course, we have some political democracy. Let's bring it into the economy. You know, this is our way of inoculating ourselves against communism and fascism, right? This was part of the story. In the Cold War period, that changed, right? The overwhelming concern was, you know, Soviet communism. There were anxieties that cooperatives were um, a kind of front for that, even though, you know, the difference between a, you know, a rural, U.S. rural cooperative and a, um, you know, a, a kind of Soviet collectivized farm was just night and day. It's a totally different model. But as a result, even though these cooperatives like, you know, Lando Lakes kept going strong through that period, they really suppressed their cooperative identity and didn't talk about it. And so, you know, I never knew. I knew my grandfather. I never knew that his business that he, you know, wore a belt buckle for that I remember when I was a little kid, you know, was a cooperative um, because he just didn't talk about it in those terms. Um, because he was, you know, he was a conservative businessman doing good old American capitalism. It just happened to be in a cooperative. And as a result, capitalism has been allowed to take credit for all this stuff that was actually built by by cooperative businesses. So now we're kind of playing in reverse. More and more businesses are realizing that they can actually reach a new generation by talking about their cooperative values and model, some more than others. It's remarkable to me how few do actually draw on this opportunity, how Lando Lakes, you know, doesn't talk about the fa this fact that they're cooperative very much, you know, that State Farm isn't out there recruiting millennials by talking about how you come be a co-owner of the of your own insurance company. You know, they're they're not doing that at all. You know, it's it's a shame, but it's it's really the the result of a a history of suppression. You know, th that has left us with an amnesia uh, about the really powerful and heroic uh, uh, legacy that we have to build on. And you also write that co-ops have a lower chance of failure. What are the reasons for that? That's after the startup phase. There's data suggesting that once a co-op and an investor-owned business get going, you know, the co-op is going to be more resilient. You know, when you're a cooperatively owned business, you have a you have a much more you have a much higher incentive for self-preservation than an investor-owned business. You know, investor 
um, is hurt less, you know, closing down the plants and liquidating the, the assets than cooperative members. You know, there's more, more of a likelihood that, you know, a cooperative is, you know, members of a cooperative are going to take on some sacrifices in order to keep the business going because they depend on it so much rather than just let it go, you know, collect the money and, and run. You know, it has to do with those dynamics, whether that's a good or a bad thing. You know, I think it's, it's interesting in some cases, you know, in some ways you might ask, hey, why don't we have an economy where it's easier for things to come and go, enables us to have a different kind of resilience. You know, I think there are arguments to be made on, on both ends, but it does suggest that uh, cooperative businesses, because of their structure, have an incentive to behave differently when they encounter hardship than than investor-owned businesses. We also share a passion or love for religion. Um, that's my background in academics. I happen to not have one. I just really appreciate the communities and particularly the mythologies that have come out of cultures for thousands of years. But one thing I really appreciated was you the parallels you drew between religious examples and cooperative model. And I would love if you could speak to that. Yeah, the, the, the role of, of religious communities in building some of this legacy is really significant. I want to be careful in not suggesting that you have to be religious to make this stuff work or that these communities are necessary, but they have been really significant. Uh, you know, a few examples include like, you know, the, by far the largest worker cooperative network in the world is Mondragon um, in the Basque region, started by this amazing half-blind Catholic priest in the 1950s. The credit union uh, movement in the U.S. was, um, you know, came out of a model, you know, developed by uh, a, a Jesuit priest in the in the uh, maritime prov- provinces working with farmers was taken up by the um, Quebecois uh, journalist uh, Alphonse Desjardins, who built it into a kind of parish-based um, banking system that is now the largest financial banking business in in Quebec, um, and then it was imported by the Protestant elder and you know kind of religious leader as well as um, not so much religious leader but involved uh, but businessman um, uh, 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 Edward Filene, you know the department store mogul who uh, brought it into uh, U.S. law and promulgated the model uh, often through religious communities and so forth. Um, th- you know, this is a, you know, a story that repeats itself all over the place. I think there are, certainly are ways in which, you know, religious community enables a kind of trust and solidarity that might um, make some of the collective action problems a little easier uh, that come up with, with cooperatives. And so that's probably, you know, the kind of back of the envelope explanation for um, why there seems to be such prevalence of, of religious participation. Another feature of it, I think, too, is just, you know, the call on many religious communities to um, have an imagination beyond just the way things are and to act a little differently from how the rest of the world acts. And uh, cooperatives have been a tool for that. They enable people to um, set their own terms and values in the economy. You know, as a result, some of the really interesting uh, cooperative innovations have uh, uh, arisen, you know, really successful business innovations have arisen, you know, out of religious communities and religious inspiration. Now, last question, I, I, as I mentioned, I find your optimism refreshing and, and the, the sort of uh, focus of the work refreshing as well. What gives you hope that the cooperative model will be implemented more as we move forward, both in America and perhaps globally? Well, I, I think that the the nature of the problem is just so um, is is becoming so clear. Uh, the fact that we have a just incredibly widespread accountability problem. Uh, our businesses are, especially the really big, important, growing, dominant ones, are just not accountable the way we need them to be. You know, we can drag them in front of Congress as many times as we want, but they're, you know, they're so clearly on their own agenda. And we need a, a different um, a different strategy. Another difficulty here that we're in is that um, we're no longer in the realm of of national companies. You know, the old model of what's good for GM is what's good for America. You know, that's not the case when we're looking at companies that are by their nature tr- running on transnational networks. Um, we need governance for them that is transnational and we can't just rely on a hodgepodge of, of national regulations to deal with 
the emerging digital economy. I think we need to build democracy into the, the businesses themselves and uh, govern those businesses from within much more uh, than we're used to. We've been relying a lot on external regulation that just no longer has any teeth and isn't really appropriate anyway uh, with these uh, with these emerging companies. Uh, so, so the need is really great, but also it's really critical to recognize the diversity of these forms. One thing that I've been concerned about some is you know, people take one cooperative that they've seen in one place and then they impose it, impose that model on a very different kind of creature. You know, for instance, our chain is adopted the bylaws of a consumer cooperative, REI, in order to run what is kind of ambiguously sort of an investor slash producer slash question mark cooperative. I think actually the the challenge is much more interesting. You know, we need to think about, you know, what kind of organization uh, is this? What are the appropriate stakeholders? You know, what are the appropriate incentive structures to organize those stakeholders and draw from the diversity of uh, uh, of the history of this model in order to meet the new, like, super interesting sci-fi challenges that we get to work with right now? So I think the, the more we, the less we imagine that this is a simple solution that's, you know, kind of plug in fix for everything and more, the more we recognize that, you know, economic democracy is an opportunity and an adventure and something that doesn't have a kind of fixed answer waiting for us, you know, the more powerful it will be for us. Thank you.